Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Vishwaranjan Bhattacharji, uh, and everyone calls me Bhatta. Uh, I am from the IBM TJ Watson Research Center, and uh, uh, this is a joint presentation with my uh, teammate Ashka Trivedi, who uh, goes by the name Ashka. And uh, we will be talking about Indus, a set of models uh, that uh, neural network models that uh, we have uh, jointly developed with uh, the Science Mission Directorate uh, in NASA. And Indus, uh, in case you're wondering, is the name of a constellation uh, visible in the Southern Hemisphere, which has uh, five bright stars. Um, and given that uh, th this uh, uh, work represents uh, or uh, is supposed to benefit five different uh, uh, divisions of uh, the, the SMD, it seemed an appropriate name. So the work actually uh, has contribution from many people. Uh, who are listed here, uh, spanning three divisions of IBM research, uh, five different uh, entities in NASA, as well as two university entities uh, who are listed there. And uh, uh, we have a paper published. Its uh, title is Indus Effective and Efficient Language Models for Scientific Applications. Uh, we have uh, shown you the link to the archive paper there. Uh, we would encourage you to take a look at this link uh, because it has a lot of information uh, way beyond uh, what I'm going to describe here, okay? So uh, uh, what all are we going to cover here? Uh, this is a, a higher level uh, summary. Uh, you know, large language models uh, are, uh, are, uh, do remarkably well on natural language processing tasks. This include things like, you know, document classification, name entity recognition, information retrieval, question answering, summarization, paraphrasing, etc. And um, generally, uh, this kind of large language models are trained on open source general purpose data. By, by that, we mean things like, you know, you must have heard of Wikipedia, or you must have heard of Common Crawl, right? Or you must have heard of open web text, those kind of uh, 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 data, which are, uh, you know, general data. Um, and uh, uh, the models that are that's trained they come out in different uh, uh, form factors or of ours. Like, you know, you must have heard of encoder models or decoder models or encoder decoder models, right? We will cover what they are, but essentially it's good to know that, you know, these are the kind of uh, form factors these large language models uh, 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 appear in. Now, uh, uh, what uh, uh, people have shown is that if you train these large language models on domain focused uh, uh, data sets, right? They perform better on uh, tasks for th those domains. And th there have been previous work, for example, in finance, biology, cybersecurity, or science, right? Uh, which has shown this to be true. And uh, it was felt that uh, 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 we needed large language models focused on earth science, biology, physics, heliophysics, planetary sciences, astrophysics, space sciences domains which is of interest to NASA and also to uh, the general public, right? And so for that, we trained an encoder model using uh, 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 domain-specific uh, data, which we'll cover. We also trained a sentence embedding model uh, to address information retrieval tasks. And we built smaller versions of this model so that, you know, we could run it, uh, can run it very fast when needed or when we need to run it in resource constraints environments. And then when you build this kind of models in new areas, then you also need benchmarks. So we came up with new benchmarks, which have been open source. And all the models and the benchmarks that you see have been uh, open source and available in uh, uh, Hugging Face. Now, let's start off at a higher level. What are encoder models? Encoder models, the examples of encoder models include BERT or Roberta. You may have heard the name. And the way they work is, they take a, a text input that you see there and they can basically uh, then uh, uh, take the text input and give you encode it right and give you a set of numbers representing each uh, uh, word in uh, that you give and when they give you that uh, numbers right uh, they also consider what the word is in context to others so in this case if you tell it to encode the word two it will notice that you know in the sentence on the left is welcome and the right is DZ. So it will the encode, encoding is done appropriately. So it's not in isolation, but in context of where the word appears. So uh, that is what an encoder does. 
And when the, the way you train an encoder model is you can take a sentence and basically you mask off part of this. So you might uh, 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 give the model welcome blank DC and ask it to basically predict what this masked word is. So in this case, you know, if it is not well trained, it may give you some junk word. But over time, as you train it well, right, it will learn that, you know, the masked word is actually two based on the fact that uh, on the two, one side you have welcome and on the other side you have DC. And then encoder model like this, as we said, is very useful for certain tasks like document classification or name entity recognition, etc. Now, on the other hand, you may have heard of uh, GPT-2, which is actually a decoder model. The, a decoder model, what happens is that it works slightly differently in which when you give it a word, it will uh, try to get a, a number representation of the word with context to what is on its left rather than on left and right. And uh, 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 in this case, if you give it two, it will consider the fact that before it comes welcome. And so it will give you a number representation for two based on that. And this is very useful, uh, you know, because uh, you can use that to actually predict the, what the next word will be, right? So a, a decoder, the way it is used is, if you give it welcome, it can, for example, be used to predict that the next word is going to be two, right? And you then turn around and give it welcome two, and then it can uh, predict that the next word will be DC. Then you turn around and give it welcome to DC, and then, you know, it can basically say that the next word will be sir until it uh, thinks that the probability of any of these is low. Now, uh, uh, there are also encoder decoder models where you can take an encoder uh, for a sentence like, you know, flowers always smell and create a feature representation and then feed it to a decoder. And the decoder will then start, uh, uh, you know, generating subsequent tokens. For example, it could take this flower always smells as an input and then basically uh, uh, give you the next token, which is flowers always smells good. Okay. Now, uh, uh, in, in the case of uh, a uh, specific domain, right? Let's take, for example, biology. What happens is that you have the same kind of tasks that you have in general purpose, named entity recognition, document classification, and those kind of tasks. But the data you operate on is very specific to a domain. For example, uh, in the case of biology, you might be looking for things like, you know, uh, the cocaine or myco myocardial injury or uh, bundle branch block. Whereas in general purpose, you know, you might be looking for the team Barcelona or the country Spain and things like that. So you're looking for specific terms uh, in a specific domain compared to the general purpose one. Similarly, document classification, you might be doing document classification on various types of cancer rather than uh, you know, document classification on uh, uh, various types of, uh, 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 let's say, sports. OK. Uh, are you able to hear me still? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we have the microphone mute. OK, no. yeah, all right, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to be sure because uh, I was not getting any feedback. Okay, good. So, you know, uh, this this is the characteristics of uh, industry vertical models. And so we are trying to build an industry vertical model on the domain of science. All right. Now, uh, the other, other applications of this kind of models, for example, you can go to Google and, you know, you can ask a question, right? So you may ask a general purpose question, uh, Barcelona uh, the soccer team uh, is part of uh, uh, which country? Right. Uh, but uh, one could also go and ask Google a very specific question. How does Cape act on severe thunderstorm? Cape here, it does not uh, mean a, a land or it does not mean a kind of uh, a clothing people wear. Cape is short for convective available potential energy. Right. It's a very specific term in earth science. Now, you want uh, the model to be able to understand that and give you a very specific answer. So, for example, if uh, someone asks you, how does Cape act on severe thunderstorm, then, you know, uh, the right answer is may increase the likelihood of severe th storms. Google may not be able to give you, as you can see in the output, right? But a industry specific model uh, fashioned into a QA system can actually give you the right answer. So that is the power of uh, uh, an industry specific model, in this case, a science model. How does one use this kind of models that we are talking about for actually question answering, right? 
one way is that you know it's called a retrieval augmented generation where you have a set of documents and when a question comes in you turn around and look into the documents using an information retrieval model uh, to get a list of paragraphs which are relevant to the question in this case if i were to ask you know again about cape it will give me certain paragraphs which are relevant to cape then i can take the question and the link uh, uh, rank list of paragraphs and do either a machine reading comprehension or a, a, a generation to get the answers and scores now the key point here is that you know generation you have heard of models like you know gpt or uh, llama or uh, others right the key part is to be able to uh, retrieve the documents uh, uh, efficiently for which the ir model is used and the way the ir model is built is you take an encoder model and then you find you need for a specific task to get an ir model and here uh, in this talk we are going to cover how we created an encoder model which can be used for a lot of tasks like uh, document processing name entity recognition and others and it can also be used to create this ir model so this is the overview of the indus models that uh, we are going to cover uh, basically uh, you know uh, the key aspect is the indus base which is an encoder uh, model of size base which is 125 million parameters and it has been trained using this mass language model uh, that i talked about uh, mechanism over uh, earth science data biomedical astrophysics astronomy general science and english data and uh, then you know we created a smaller version of it called the indus small using representation uh, distillation and once these two were ready then we took the indus base model fine tuned it with the data shown on the right which is scientific open qa duplicate pairs which is uh, you know embedding training corpus and we created this indus retrieval model which is actually a sentence transformer model and once we created that we use the indus small and the indus retriever model to create an indus uh, retriever small model and uh, so uh, then you test it on various data sets which are shown in the bottom from uh, natural language understanding benchmarks as well as information retrieval benchmarks and so that is the entire overhead uh, you know overview picture of the indus uh, uh, model setup now uh, this is how uh, you know a, a models are trained you start off with data data is a key and you know uh, uh, good data makes for good models and the data that we got came from uh, nasa as well as open source and then you have to clean the data you have to bring it into a stage uh, it's called curation where you can actually then train right and the, uh, that cost was done again jointly with nasa and ibm and then you train and uh, uh, you basically tokenize the data into forms where then the training can start and then you train that was done by ibm and then you have uh, benchmarks and evaluations right you need to be able to evaluate a model and uh, you need to have benchmarks for that that was done by ibm nasa as well as from open source and then you use these models in proof of concepts uh, which was done by NASA because uh, they have a lot of these uh, use cases for which uh, these scientific models are needed. So now let's start focus on the encoder model. The encoder model is of 125 million uh, uh, model uh, parameter model, as I said, and it was trained on 60 billion tokens. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you can consider two tokens make a word. So this is something like 30 billion uh, to words. That was a corpus on which it was trained. And uh, it came from various sources like, you know, uh, any model, uh, English model, you need to learn the English language. And thus, it's good to have Wikipedia there because it gives you the language uh, uh, understanding. And then for biology, we have PubMed and PMC, two large data sets. And uh, for, uh, we had the uh, data sets for astronomy, astrophysics, physics, math, general science, and then earth science, right? And on the right, the pie chart shows you the distribution of the data uh, a significant amount of data uh, uh, is, you know, from uh, NASA ADS, uh, PubMed, PMC. And uh, uh, since this science, you know, it has specific science terminology. So we, it, we, we built a special vocabulary for this, which is used to uh, for the model to understand. And the model architecture was uh, the conditional Roberta model architecture, which uh, you must have heard of. If not, there is a Roberta paper which can tell you about it. Okay. So... Firstly, you know, why is, uh, 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 why, what is tokenizer and what the vocabulary for this NASA models, right? Uh, every model has a set of uh, terms that it understands. 
in the case of robota it is 50000 terms and in the case of the nasa models also indus models also you know we stuck to the 50000 terms however the terms themselves are different uh, half the terms approximately you know 22000 uh, terms are uh, common which are general purpose terms that you uh, english terms like you know emergency biology uh, show reason those are examples of general purpose terms but then uh, the NASA, the indus models right they have very specific scientific terminology which then uh, makes it uh, 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 useful for science for example things like immunohistochemistry it understands that it is one word <coughs> anti fungal or diameters or spliced uncoded these are extra words that it understands and to make space for these extra words, we sacrifice some words which thought was uh, not very frequently used in English language, like, you know, Irald, uh, 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 Chant, Ether, which we thought was not needed. So thus, you can say that uh, the Indus models understands 27,000 new type of words and 22,000 common words that is between Robota and the uh, Indus models. Which means that if you take this kind of an input sentence that is shown there, which comes from a paper, Suarez Calvet, right? Uh, novel tau biomarkers phosphorylated at this. This is actually a, a sentence from a paper, right? You will find how the uh, Roberta general purpose model breaks it down into tokens and how the Indus uh, model breaks it down. You will find that the Indus model, uh, you know, understands big terms like biomarkers, phosphorylated, etc., and keeps them as one uh, token. Whereas the Robota tokenizer, since they do, doesn't know the terminology, it tends to break it down into smaller uh, tokens, uh, which uh, then it can understand. The problem with this uh, breaking it into too many tokens is that in your during training, it takes a lot more time, right? Because every token is uh, a separate entity, and uh, uh, thus training takes a lot of time, and uh, you know it uh, it's not very expressive. So that's as far as, uh, you know, what the vocabulary was. The second part is training, right? To train a model like this over 30 billion words or 60 billion tokens, we had to use 192 GPUs working together. And the way they work together is that, uh, you know, at all the GPUs, they do some compute where they learn, then they turn around and talk to each other. They synchronize their weights, right? And then again, they go back to computing and again, they turn around and talk to each other. Uh, for maximum efficiency, you have to uh, lessen the amount of time you spent talking to each other and, uh, you know, focus on compute. We were able to use 192 GPUs uh, for this training and we got 90% efficiency in this kind of uh, tree-based communication that is shown here. And as you train, the model tends to learn uh, over time and the perplexity, which is, uh, you know, a, a measure of uh, how uh, uh, how much uh, turbulence is there keeps going down. So you'll find that the training perplexity has gone down and so has the validation perplexity. And over time, over this uh, 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 10 days of training it took us, over 50,000 steps, right? It actually learned a lot, as you can see. Once the model uh, is trained, uh, we wanted to uh, uh, benchmark it. So one of the benchmarks we used is the blur benchmark. It's a famous benchmark in the biomedical space. It consists of tasks for named entity recognition, uh, then document classification, question answering, sentence similarity, etc. And uh, we decided to compare our new model, the Indus base uh, of 125 million parameters ex uh, uh, against the Robota model, which is a general purpose model, and the Cybert model you might have heard about, which is a science uh, a bert like model, right? Um, and uh, uh, we we compared against all the benchmarks listed there. Uh, the ones in dark is the ones obviously which are uh, the winning ones. You see for named entity recognition, uh, the Indus model beats the other two. Uh, you will also see the same thing for uh, relational extraction or uh, for uh, 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 PICO. And for, so for document classification, in question answering, you know, uh, 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 we do well in one benchmark and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the cyber does well in another one benchmark. Sentence similarity is a is a the 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 bosses DSS is very small and it tends to be uh, uh, slightly fickle, uh, but there the cyber is doing well. Overall, you can see in most of the benchmarks the Indus base model actually uh, does better than the competitors, whether general purpose or the science ones. 
Then we also uh, benchmarked in earth science specific ones. For example, there is a, uh, a named editor recognition task on climate change, where you can see the Indus based model does better than the Cybert model or the Roberta model. And then there is an extracting question answering task. Both these uh, uh, tasks are new and focused on this domain. And here also you can see that the Indus based model does better than the Cybert model as well as the Roberta model. So uh, once you created this large model and you know it's working well, then the question is, can you create smaller versions of this model so that you can run on CPUs, you can run on research concentrated environments, and even on a larger GPUs where the other model might run, this will run faster. So we uh, uh, do a process called knowledge distillation in which we take this 12 layer, 11 uh, layer model and we built a four layer model out of it. And so you use that 12 layer model as a teacher and then you go through with some further training of uh, distillation and out comes a 38 million parameter model, uh, which uh, uh, you know you try to keep uh, its accuracy to be as high as possible. And I will show you figures on how high the accuracy is. So thus you end up with a model which is uh, very small, very fast, and uh, 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 almost as accurate as the larger one. So here is uh, in this slide, I show you the latency of uh, uh, these two models, the larger one and the smaller one on a four core CPU. You can find that it, it's about five times faster. And a GPU, you know, the uh, it's almost uh, 1.5 to 1.7 times faster, this uh, smaller model. And um, uh, when you look at the performance on the right side for the climate change benchmark, you find that compared to smaller models like TinyBert or Medialum, uh, which are open source models, the Indus model is actually performing much better, right? And then if you compare its performance on the same benchmark against the Indus base, you find that the Indus uh, base was 64, yet uh, in this case, you're getting 50, uh, 50, uh, 54, right? But uh, you are getting a model which is five times faster. So depending on your scenario, you can either use the Indus base or you can use the Indus small. And there are a lot more results in this paper that I, I had talked about previously. So if you're interested, uh, please, I encourage you to uh, uh, take a look at this paper. Now uh, we come to the uh, sentence transformer or retrieval part. And Ashka is going to take over uh, the description of this part. Ashka? Yes, thank you, Peter. So I'll be discussing how we created the Indus embedding models, which are an important application of encoder models in the field of generation. So specifically, we use these type of models as an IR model for retrieval augmented generation, which Pata talked about before. So on this chart here, you can see that we have two models of different sizes. Uh, we have an Indus, Indus retriever base model and a small model created through knowledge distillation. And the reason why we have these two models is similar to what Pada outlined. Depending on your latency or resource requirements or constraints, you may want to choose either the smaller model, which is going to be faster, or the larger model, which is going to be slower but more accurate. Um, next slide, please. Um, right. So the way that we created these sentence embedding models is that we train them on a contrastive objective. And what these models are trained to do is they take a query and try to match the embeddings of a query to that of a relevant paragraph and keep the embeddings away from that of a non-relevant paragraph. So the training data usually consists of pairs, which where pairs indicate relevance. So we have a corpus of about 360 million data pairs that span a lot of domains, from general purpose domains to scientific domains to astrophysics domains. Um, when we were collecting this data, we use both naturally available pairs, such as title and body pairs, as well as annotated pairs like question answering pairs, duplicate question pairs, et cetera. And in this corpora, we also include a lot of domain-specific pairs, which come from data that was given to us by NASA or PubMed and PMC data for biomedical domains. Um, we also try to span multiple data categories and define the notion of relevance in different ways, such as relevance could be between the title of a, of a document and the body of a document. It could be between a question and an answer, two uh, paraphrases of the same sentence or paragraph, as well as entailment pairs. 
And each component, even though I use the term query and passage, each component could be either a sentence or a passage. And we have different types of data formats, like sentence to passage, um, sentence to sentence, et cetera. Next slide, please. Right. So when I said that we train this on a contrastive objective, what we're doing on a very high level is this figure on the left. So we're training what is known as bi-encoders, which take two encoders, it's the same model, and independently encodes each sentence or uh, paragraph. So for a given pair of texts, we first individually encode them, and then we compute a sort of similarity score, which is usually a cosine similarity, to indicate whether or not these two pairs of text are relevant. And we train it on in the objective of making the similarity score between encodings of relevant documents higher and between non-relevant documents smaller. Um, in order to create the index small retriever, like index retriever small models, we again use a process called knowledge distillation, where we actually ask a smaller model to mimic the scores produced by different pairs of of text. And that's how we get um, a, a smaller model that's, again, 38 million parameters. Um, but it runs much faster with almost all of the performance of the teacher. And as I'll show in some slides, we actually get uh, results better than the teacher model on some benchmarks. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So as but I mentioned before, after we do some kind of training, we do want to evaluate these models. So there is a family of evaluation tasks for the um, information retrieval domain. It's called BEER. Um, but none of these are very, very specific to the domains of interest that we had, like earth sciences, astrophysics, etc. So we created what we call the NASA RR task, which is a retrieval task on domain-specific data. The way that this was created was the um, uh, NASA uh, subject matter experts annotated a list of about 500 question-answer pairs. And we split this into a dev and a test set. And so our test set has about 400 questions that can be answered from a given corpus. We followed the beer retrieval format. So if, you, if anyone is familiar with information retrieval and the beer task, this data is in a format that can be ingested directly. So the queries here are questions, and the corpus is made up of all the answer paragraphs that were annotated by NASA SMEs, as well as 200,000 um, sampled abstracts from other data sources as well. So we have here, and all of these questions are answerable from this given corpus, and the task is to, to be able to retrieve a relevant passage given a specific question. The main metric that we use is recall, and this is because this is not a ranking task. There is only one paragraph that answers a specific question. And so the task is basically to retrieve that one paragraph. Um, all of these benchmarks have been open source, and I encourage you to look at the link that is pasted below if you're interested in IR applications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so what is the performance of our models on this NASA RR benchmark? I have the slide here comparing three open source models indicated in orange, all of different sizes. We have two of the smaller models and one of the larger model. Um, and these are all uh, considered extremely good state-of-the-art models. And for comparison, the blue bars are the Indus retrieval models. And as you can see, um, they do much better than um, the open source models on the NASA IR task, where even the smaller model that we created through distillation outperforms the larger model, on, which is the left um, leftmost blue bar. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also want to discuss why it's important that we use the custom encoder model that is the Indus encoder models here, as opposed to just using a general purpose Roberta model. So I have an ablation between three models. The leftmost one in green is a model that is trained off of a general Roberta type model uh, using only general purpose pairs or fine tuning data, no domain specific pairs. The orange bar is using the indus based model as a starting point and fine tuning it on general purpose data. And the left bar, uh, sorry, the right blue bar is using the indus model as a starting point, fine tuning on both general purpose data as well as domain specific data. So you can see that these changes are incremental. 
using an index-based or a, a, a domain-specific encoder model outperforms using a um, general purpose Roberta model. And furthermore, adding some domain-specific training data also helps improve um, the performance. So overall, there's almost an 18% relative gain of using um, a domain-specific encoder and domain-specific data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right. And finally, I just want to tie this together on where exactly these um, embedding models are used. So they are used in uh, the RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation setup. You have a, a, a lot of text that you encode using these embedding models and store in a vector database. Once a user asks a question, you also get an embedding for that question and use the vector database to understand, to get relevant documents. After you get the relevant documents, you pass these to a generative model that ultimately gives a response answering the user's questions while being faithful to the given document. And that is the end of our uh, presentation. If there are any questions or any discussions, uh, we can talk about that.